So how are things going over in Toronto? Uh, I can't complain. Um, yeah, I'm deliberately cropping my hair so you can't see it because my, my eldest has given me two haircuts and I'm due for a third. <laughs> uh, but she keeps putting off the third back here. I think I'm going to crop it even lower. So you're still doing in-house haircuts? Yeah, Ontario has opened up, but it's geographically selective. And <laughs> Toronto is, uh, everyone loves it because everyone hates Toronto so much. And these are good days for the Toronto haters because all of Ontario has opened up into what I think is called stage two, which is like retail has opened up. You can get a haircut. I think other um, everyday retail services, except in Toronto. So in Toronto, you can't get a restaurant meal, even on a patio. Really? And Yeah. And you can't get a haircut, but you can, like if you drive, I don't know, 45 minutes outside Toronto, you can do it. So you get all these weird conversations with people who are like, yeah, I'm going to drive to Kingston to <laughs> get my nails done or something like that. It's, and I'm, I'm not even sure if you're allowed to do it. Like it's, it's, I don't even want to ask on social media because I know, um, the, uh, the cancel culture police will come. I mean, I'm, I have so many outstanding warrants with them that I don't need to add another, but it may be illegal to like go get a haircut in Collingwood or something. I don't know, huh. but I'm scared to do it. So I'm just, uh, I'm going to get my, my daughter to give me another one. Also it's cheaper. So yeah, free. Um, what's, the, what's the justification for keeping Toronto shut down? So Ontario, I think, is in recent days, it's had like, I think, between two and three hundred new cases per day. We, we might be below 200. I'm not sure. But almost all of them are concentrated in Toronto. So yeah. it, like take a place like Kingston, which is uh, two and a half hours from Toronto. You've had people there. I think like in total, they've only had a couple of dozen cases there. It's, it's a fairly large city. Uh, there's a couple hundred thousand people. And they've rightly complained that they they haven't been able to open up <clears throat> largely because of health concerns about Toronto. And so the idea is, uh, which, which I approve of, is they've taken a regional approach. So some regions have been able to open up and Toronto, Toronto looks like it'll be the last region to open up to most kinds of retail. Right. That sucks. Yeah. Vancouver has been open since uh, the beginning of June and some, spots were opened up even before that so. yeah bc is like the the model students in the class right because you got I mean, a couple it's been a couple of weeks since uh i don't think you're quite at zero cases but you're almost there yeah it's uh, amazing yeah it's good and so what's happening over there i'm curious in terms of like black lives matters actions and things like that anything so the black lives matter thing is interesting because so there have been protests in Toronto, um, uh, peaceful protests, uh, which is good. My understanding, at least at the beginning, is they were very careful to say that it wasn't Black Lives Matter. It was they. It was it was a group whose name I hadn't heard before, and I remember there was some static on on social media when somebody suggested it was a Black Lives Matter protest because the Black Lives Matter here in Toronto has been around for several years, but the organizers were somewhat controversial. One of them. Uh, got into some kind of uh, financial trouble at University of Toronto, I think it was. I think there might have even been litigation. She was part of the student government. And the Black Lives Matter movement in Toronto had this very um, odd agenda where, like, it had very little relation to what actually ordinary members of the black community wanted. Like, there was a lot of discussion of trans misogynistic this and trans misogynistic that. Um, which is actually one of the weird features of Black Lives Matter because it's, I don't think it's centralized. And uh, like, for instance, some BLM chapters have focused on things like uh, the Middle East and uh, Palestinian and Israeli issues, which most black people I talk to, it's not foremost on their mind. Um, so in Toronto, there have been Black Lives Matter protests in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement, but I don't think at least most of them have been operated under the umbrella of Black Lives Matter. Hmm. I'm curious to know, um, we'll, we'll get to what I wanted to talk to you about initially at some point. <laughs> I won't derail too much. But I'm curious to know, like, if you think that 
all of these protests, I mean, particularly in the U.S., um, because that's where it's obviously centralized, um, are going to have an impact on the COVID cases, yeah. which apparently have just disappeared off the yeah. face of the earth. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I what bothered me most about the COVID stuff was, was the hypocrisy, because you had these public health officials who just... Uh, practically the day before were telling us that we all had to stay inside and then suddenly it was no well you don't have to stay inside if you want to protest this thing uh and and, and a number of infectious diseases experts called them out on that and and even in in progressive circles i think there was a lot of pushback on not just the hypocrisy but the fact people saying this is going to erode trust. So this isn't the last pandemic we're ever going to face. And the next time, whether it's in five years or 20 years, that people face a pandemic and we say, oh, we have to stay inside. The response is going to be, oh, just like we had to stay inside in, in May 2020 when suddenly we were all able to go out in the street to protest this stuff. That said, the timing of it was such that it wasn't at the acute phase of the pandemic. And if you are young, as most protesters are, and asymptomatic, and living in a community that isn't in a state of acute pandemic, I'm not sure there's going to be a statistically observable um, uh, rise in the number of cases, especially since, since at least late May, I think everyone in Ontario and many other Canadian jurisdictions, everyone who's wanted to get tested usually can find a way to get tested. Uh, so most people who are sick who have some flu-like symptoms, they know if they have the disease, I think. Now, obviously, there's a period of a couple of days when you're asymptomatic and you can still spread the disease. But young asymptomatic people don't seem to be a leading vector of the disease. In fact, as, as, as maybe you know, I think in Quebec, uh, less so in Ontario, but in Quebec, something like 80% of the deaths have been in uh, assisted care facilities, old age homes, as they used to be known. In Ontario, I don't think it's quite 80%, but it's very high. So, um, although young and old are supposed to obey the same public health prescriptions, in reality, the risk is much higher for old people. And there are some 70 and 80 year olds out protesting, but, but largely, as we've seen, it's teenagers and young adults. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I think that it sort of made a lot of people question why we're doing a lot of these social distancing measures, particularly for people who are young and, and healthy right. in, in settings I mean, you would think sort of like a protest would be the worst case scenario in terms of setting off a spike of new cases. But yeah, just because of the the yelling and spitting in other people's yeah, faces. Yeah, right. No, no, you're absolutely, you're absolutely <laughs> right. Is that the behaviors that make people sick are things that transmit, you know, germs from mouth and nose of one person to mouth and nose of another person. Person. And this, the data shows that it, it tends to be things like singing and yelling sports events. Like there was that notorious February 19th soccer game in Milan, where 40,000 residents of the nearby Italian city of Bergamo were in attendance. And it's thought that uh, that's one of the leading super spreader events behind the, the horrible um, death rate in, in I mean, Bergamo of thousands. Of, it was a city of 120,000 people and it lost I don't know how many thousands of people. And it was because of the sports event, in part, uh, as I said, people screaming and cheering. Um, protests are a little bit like that. But again, the age distribution is a big factor. And if you look at the data, it's a little bit awkward because I think I looked at the total number of people in Ontario who died who were younger than the age of 60. And the total number was 107. This is a few days ago I looked at the data. Now, 107 people is obviously 107 people too many. And, you know, people who are in their 70s and 80s and 90s and older, obviously their lives count too. But if we had to do this all over again, it would not have been unreasonable for premiers and state governors to maybe not just take a geographically based approach, but an age stratified based approach and say, if you're young, if you don't have hypertension and you don't have diabetes and you don't have obesity, those are the three leading comorbidities, um, you know, you have more flexibility than if you're much older and you have comorbidities. Um, in general, men have been more susceptible than women to the disease. So particularly young, asymptomatic, 
otherwise healthy women who are less than 40 or 50, uh, your chance of, of, of being severely affected by the disease are very low. Now, of course, your chance of passing it on are high. So, so some of the places in the world where the death rate was highest was, were places that had multi-generational households. So in Italy, they have a lot of multi-generational households. So somebody who's 30 or 40 who just gets the sniffles, you pass it on to grandpa and grandpa dies. And in Quebec, you had a lot of refugees and other disadvantaged people who were living in intergenerational households, in some cases as refugees, and they were working in old age homes, and and, and that, unfortunately, that were tragic results. So, um, yeah, for young people, they don't have much to worry about. And even in my neighborhood, like in my neighborhood, the 19-year-olds I see running around, like there's no social distancing going on. I mean, it's it's business as usual. And but and if I were their age, I think I'd take the same approach. Um I think also a lot of people, their social networks, they just don't know of a lot of people who have gotten sick lately. Yeah. Uh, back in, in March and April, I think a lot of us heard of friends or at least friends of friends who got sick. I don't know anybody in my own social or professional network who's gotten the illness in the last six weeks or even two months. And, and that affects the way people behave. You know, human beings respond to their risk environment as they perceive it with their five senses. And, and right now, um, but that's contribute that and the nice weather. I mean, people are just going out and they're, you don't see a lot of masks. Um, it's, uh, people, people are having fun. Yeah. So in relation to the protests, um, you wrote about the Tom Cotton op-ed right. at the New York times recently. And I mean, this, it seems like there's been this, culture brewing in media in North America for a little while now. And it really seems like everything has come to a head recently. Um, I mean, obviously in relation to the issue of racism and the, the protests. So um, I first, I guess I wonder, do you think that the Tom Cotton op-ed should have been published in the first place? So if we want to talk specifically about the Tom Cotton op-ed. Uh, so as, as, as most viewers probably know Tom Cotton is a conservative Republican lawmaker. And in his op-ed, which I think it appeared June 3rd in the, on the New York Times, on the opinion section of the New York Times website, it advocated the use of military troops in the streets of American cities to quell the, the unrest and the rioting and looting, which was accompanying the legitimate protests in some cases, but certainly not all cases. And this aroused the ire of, of, of James Bennett's colleagues. So James Bennett the, was the, now the former editor of the New York Times opinion section. And they said, uh, often very publicly, as is the case now, people go on Twitter to, to criticize each other, and I, which I think is in violation of the New York Times policies, but no one cares or enforces these things. And they said, how, you know, how can, how could James publish this? It's outlandish. It's, it's awful. The, the awkward fact here is that uh, survey data from, collected May 31 and June 1, which is probably around the time this piece was being edited for publication, indicated that something like 35 to 40 percent of self-described liberals in the United States were in support of the idea of troops in, in in the streets of American cities at that time. And something like 37%, if I remember correctly, of black survey respondents were okay with, not more than okay, they, they said they supported the idea of troops in the streets of American cities because you know black people own businesses, black people have homes, black people have children and, and worry about you know, the same things that, that everybody else worries about, uh, in addition to all the other things they have to worry about. And I remember the statistic that stuck in my mind because I'm I'm 51. Uh, 48% of blacks, black survey respondents over the age of 45 said they agreed with the proposition of putting U.S. troops in the streets. So James Bennett was effectively fired. He stepped down, but he was effectively fired for the crime of publishing a piece that his colleagues found offensive, but that almost half of black people themselves in the United States, if this survey, survey data is to be trusted, agreed with. Now, maybe they didn't agree with everything that Tom Cotton said in his piece. I'm sure it was a, it was a strenuously ar argued op-ed piece that 
went beyond the, the simple proposition I'm describing here. But it just shows that the New York Times, which is a mainstream, often described as a mainstream center-left publication, because of the polarizing effect of social media, uh, you know, even staffers working in a place like that now are drawn to some of the most radical fringes, either on the left or the right, and the New York Times is going to be the left, and they're actually much more liberal than the black community whose interests they purport to be championing with their campaign to oust one of their, their colleagues. It's, it's actually quite extraordinary. Yeah, and not only that, but it's that they would prefer not to represent, you know, what a large chunk of the population believes and supports and not discuss ideas that, you know, much of the population wants to discuss and is engaged with for, you know, they essentially just really want the New York Times, I guess, to represent their perspectives. Right. And that's it. Well, look, so that's, uh, okay, Th this is a process that you and I have observed uh, actually since the first day that you and I met electronically, because I remember, uh, I think it was maybe 2016 or thereabouts when I was an editor at The Walrus, and uh, I mean, you pitched me a piece, which I think I published, and I remember, you know, and then it was around this time that you were at a left-wing publication, uh, and the publication in question Basically, they had a party line view on what it means to be a feminist and who is included under that umbrella. We don't have to get into that because it's uh, it's its whole other thing. But 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, it might have been the case that a left wing publication, there'd be many different views of what it means to be feminist. I mean, feminism itself, you know, from from, from the day the first two feminists existed, they argued with each other about what feminism ex means. Like it's just, that's, that's why there's different waves of feminism and, and such. Uh, and social media, we all thought would be a pluralizing influence, you know, let a, let a, a million flowers bloom, everyone had their own social media account. It's had the opposite effect, because social media ends up being a way to keep tabs on people to see what hashtags they use. And there's actually been a consolidation and a centralizing uh, effect on on different camps so that, you know, if you're at the New York Times and your relationships are governed by this thick web of social media, people use those social media webs to crowdsource, okay, what's the correct opinion on this? What's the correct opinion on that? And that conflicts deeply with the traditional idea that the editor of an opinion section is a sort of curator. And as a curator, you, well, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. If the New York Times is a liberal publication, you say, okay, well, you know, it'd be 70% liberal and 20% centrist and 10% conservative. I used to be an editor at the National Post here in Canada, which was conservative and maybe it's the opposite. But the idea is that you had a certain freedom to curate. And that, which is why, by the way, the New York Times in the past has published pieces by Yasser Arafat and Hugo Chavez when he was the dictator of Venezuela before he passed away. Uh, I, th I believe a Taliban leader published a piece in the New York Times, and a lot of conservatives freaked out, but the defense was, hey, we're fighting the Taliban. Let's let's see what they want. Let's see what they have to say. There's value in it. And, and even many um, liberals, I don't want to say many, but certainly some, uh, some influential liberals defended James Bennett and say, if you hate Tom Cotton so much, if you hate Trump so much, don't you want to see what their logic is? Like, don't you want to understand how they think? And that that's this old fashioned liberal approach to curating different views. And that's how I approached my job when I was at um, the National Post. Uh, that's how I approached my job uh, <laughs> to much, much more mixed results uh, at the, the magazine where I worked for a few years after that. That's certainly the approach we use at Quillette, where I now work. But that's very much at odds with the idea that what you're supposed to do is reflect the views of the people in your social networks. You crowdsource the correct viewpoint on a particular issue. You publish people who have that issue. And furthermore, and this is important, and we saw this at the New York Times, the corollary, which is that when people publish views that go against that dogma, that it actually rises to a medical level of harm. And you saw that in the response. When the Tom Cotton piece was published, 
people medicalize their response. Like, you're putting me in harm. You're putting me in danger. And there's a whole range of argument. I mean, you of all, of all people are familiar with um, how this idea of medicalizing a response to an argument you disagree with can be weaponized to shut down debate. And it's it's awful to see people at the New York Times do it because that was supposed to be distinct from this crazy, cynical, hysterical world of social media. Uh, but it's it's not distinct anymore. The firewall between the New York Times uh, and, and Twitter craziness has, has obviously broken down for reasons that I, I explained a little bit uh, in the piece that I wrote. Yeah, and I mean, I guess what's troubling is how quickly, I mean, one of the things that's, that's troubling is how quickly these organizations cave. So how mm. quickly the New York Times will cave and be like, okay, you're out, James Bennett, just for just for publishing the op-ed. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. like he said anything egregious or held any offensive opinions. And I mean, I, of course, agree with you that I think it's better to air people's views so that they can be discussed and debated and taken apart if need be. Um, but I find, I'm, I'm curious to know why you think no one, no one, I mean, there's no stubbornness left, but there's no there's no one standing up for so, anything. Yeah. They just immediately cave and they're like, well, well crap, you're well, fired. Like, I mean, people so on Twitter be, are mad. <laughs> to be fair to The New York Times, they didn't immediately cave. And in fact, these things, some, it sometimes makes it worse. So uh, for a few days, Bennett was left twisting in the wind. There was apparently some Zoom call um, with Bennett and other people and and. Often it is the case that these subsequent discussions are used to further indict the individual in question because they weren't contrite enough and they didn't say the right things and people were further harmed by their justifications. I, I mean, don't forget, part of the ideology of that, that behind the medicalization of speech is the idea that when you defend yourself, that, that further hurts people because... Uh, it's either white fragility or uh, you're making them do emotional labor to explain why they find you so upsetting. Um, and so you're basically going double or nothing whenever you defend yourself. Because if your arguments are not persuasive, and they rarely are, uh, people just take the act of verbal self-defense as an additional form of crime. And, and we've, we've seen this in a number of things. In terms of why the New York Times caved, uh, I have been on both sides of this. I, as I said, I was an editor at a left-wing publication. And here's the situation you face if you're an editor of, of, of a publication, is that someone comes to you and said, you published this, this thing, and uh, it's hurting people and we find it offensive. Uh, what you want to do is say, oh, please do go well and Go well and truly fuck yourself. Like, I don't care what you think. If you have a problem, you know, write write about it in a hundred other publications. You can write about it in my publication. I will give you the right of dissent. Go on Facebook. Go on Twitter. Go on, you know, there are social media platforms I can't even pronounce. You can use any of them to tell the world what an idiot I am. Uh, but please don't tell me that you're going into cardiac arrest because I published something that you don't agree with. The problem is that it doesn't stop there because what happens is your own employees and staffers will come to you and say to you, this is really troubling because um, my friends are saying, how can you work at this publication that doesn't share your values? And, and I don't want to say this in the spirit of satire because some, some of these experiences I've had, I actually have respect for the people walking into my office. I know that they themselves might choose to be more courageous, but they're surrounded by these people in their social networks. And often these are people like in their earlier mid twenties for whom like the most important thing in the world is like how fast you put black lives matter hashtags in your Twitter account. Um, as, as soon as the stuff in Minneapolis went down, like this is their social currency. You know, they're, they're young people. They, they're never going to buy a house or have a car. They don't even have driver's licenses. They have no money. The, like, the only thing that matters in their lives are their likes and their retweets and whether they're in good standing with their peer group on social media. And so when someone walked, walked into my office when I was an editor, like they were really upset. Uh, and it wasn't just that 
they disagreed with the opinion of something that was published, they thought their whole social world was going to collapse because they worked at a publication that published a piece that was by a guy who once worked at another publication that itself had once published a piece by someone whose ex-boyfriend was accused. Of, like, I mean, honestly, it, it sounds like a joke, but this is the world these people live in. And it's a lonely and intellectually circumscribed, awful little world. But it, it isn't a world that these people made. It's a world that these people grew up in, in their social media networks when they went to college. They inherited those social media networks when they went into uh, jobs as journalists or activists or, or writers or academics or what have you. Often these, these subcultures are overlapping. And they will never be free of them. And those are the subcultures that are dictating their behavior. And if you're an editor-in-chief at a place like the New York Times, I'm describing like a little Canadian can-lit fishbowl because that's where I had this experience. At the New York Times, maybe there's a lower percentage of people who are governed by that sort of thing, but there's more of them. And all you need is one or two of them who have like a half million followers. Like at the New York Times, because the New York Times is the New York Times, a lot of the people come to the New York Times like with huge followings because the New York Times attracts stars and it makes stars. So it's one thing to piss off some Canadian poet who has 500 followers. It's different if you're pissing off someone who has 500,000 followers and writes a weekly column for you for the New York Times and that person with a single tweet could cause your organization a huge headache. 20 years ago, it was very clear who was the boss, you know, an editor or his columnist. Because what, you know, what, what was the columnist going to do 20 years ago? It was, oh, well, you wait till this Thursday. I'm going to write a column. And if you approve that column, then people are going to be mad at you. It's like, okay, good luck with that. Now they can say, by the time I walk out of this office, I'm going to have tweeted that you're a racist. And, uh, you know, have a good weekend. It's changed the power structure. And it doesn't matter if you have a workplace policy that says, well, you're not allowed to tweet mean things about your colleagues. Because those policies never work. Uh, because if a person is tweeting about something where they feel they have the moral authority, uh, especially if it's like this person hurt me or you're a racist, you're a sexist or what have you, those workplace policies mean nothing because what's the editor going to do saying, well, you're not allowed to tweet that. And now, now I'm going to discipline you because you tweeted about how you feel like you were emotionally crushed because I published Tom Cotton's piece. Like, how's that going to work out? So I have some sympathy for these editors. I think it's the system that we've backed ourselves into where we've let social media dictate what's right and what's wrong. That's the real issue. Once you allow that, what happened at the New York Times, I think, follows that and the fact that we're now living, or at least at the time, maybe still under a lockdown, people don't see each other. And if you don't see each other, social trust erodes. You're dealing with people electronically. When you deal with people electronically, you end up dealing with them the way you deal with them on Twitter. If you work with people physically and you go in every day, you build social trust, you go out to lunch, you go into their office, you see that they're a real human being. It's very difficult to say to a guy like James Bennett to his face, hey, I'm going to kill your career because you ran a column I don't like. By the way, do you want tuna or chicken for lunch? It's, it's much easier if James Bennett is just some disembodied avatar sitting on your computer screen. Because then even if it's in a Slack channel instead of Twitter, it doesn't matter. It's electronic. And it's much easier to ruin the life of somebody who's an avatar on your computer screen that it is to ruin the life of someone who exists physically. And so this problem's gonna get worse because we're all working from home more. They say that you know even after the, the lockdown where uh, many of us are never gonna go back to an office and this problem's gonna get worse. There's just less social trust. I mean, yeah, this is all really depressing to me and I think that it's- uh, You should be depressed. Yeah, I mean, like it's, yeah. I, we're all, I mean, you said that it's a really, I think he said it was a really like lonely existence for these people in this generation who grew up in they're the, terrified. Yeah. They're terrified. Yeah, and you can't I mean, I don't know how to how they they're could terrified. possibly escape it. And and they're terrified and I'm not sure why they go into journalism because the fun of journalism is investigation, right? And the nature of investigative journalism, and I mean, investigative journalism, we think of like, you know, people doing high profile takedowns of big corporations. So like, to me, investigative journalism has a broad meaning. It means like, you know, sources come to you and you, interesting stuff and you interview people and 
you, you try and get around your own preconceptions and figure out what the truth is. But the problem with doing what I just described is you don't know what you're going to find. And that's why there was always this tension at this magazine I was at, because one good thing about that magazine is they had the resources to, to do investigative work. But they're terrified of doing investigative work because what if reality turns out to be non-compliant with, ide with your ideology? It's, it's scary to do investigative work because then you're committed to actually publishing the results. So as a result, the journalism people end up doing is not investigative journalism. They do journalism that they know will lead to an ideologically compliant result, which isn't really journalism. It's a form of... It's almost like writing press releases or activism, which is fine. I mean, there's lots of good, honest, hardworking people who write press releases and do activism. Um, but that's not journalism. And it wouldn't satisfy me as, as a writer or editor to do that kind of work. Not because I don't believe in the underlying cause, just because it's, it's not journalism. Yeah. And so this is the other troubling thing that's happening right now. Um, and there's a couple of recent examples. But it's not only that um, the social media, Twitter, Twitter sphere, whatever you want to call it, um, the social media activists, and obviously not just activists, but journalists on, on social media, are going after editors and publications for publishing opinions that they don't like yeah. or opinions that they say are harmful. But mm -hmm. it, it's just that they're, they're going after people for publishing information that they don't like, yeah. like actual yeah. data. Like, And so there was this, I'm sure you followed this, um, David Shore, who's a political data analyst yeah, yeah, no, and a social that. democrat. So he, uh, just for people who didn't follow it, so he shared um, a research paper by Princeton professor Omar Wassel, which yeah. was analyzing public opinion in the 1960s. And uh, it found that this is his, his quote from his tweet, post MLK assassination race riots reduced Democratic vote share in surrounding counties by 2%, which was enough to tip the 1968 election to Nixon. Nonviolent protests increased the Democratic vote, mainly by encouraging warm elite discourse and media coverage. And that's something that a number of people have talked about. I've talked about this. You know, this is this is what research shows is that these riots often usher in the right and don't actually build support for the parties or, you know, so therefore the policies that these activists would be advocating for. And he was fired from his job yeah. for tweeting that paper. It wasn't yeah. even his paper. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with no, the no, research. It was, it it was, was true. Um, like, so that it's a fact I'm, I'm, I'm intimately aware with, of it because that exact research was described in detail before this happened, a few days before this happened, by one of my writers. So this guy's name was Zaid Jilani. Zaid right. Jilani. Yeah, is, I talked to him uh, recently. Yeah, yeah. An incredibly smart guy. He was just at Berkeley for an internship. He wrote for The Intercept, and, and he went to Baltimore, I think back in 2015, to look at the aftermath of uh, some riots that took place there. A uh, great journalist, smart guy, um, not a white supremacist, to my knowledge. Um, and he wrote a great piece for me, which we published. No one came after him. No one came after Quillette. No one came after me. No one came after the facts in his article. He cited the same scholar, uh, this Princeton scholar, who, by the way, is a mixed race scholar. And it's not, he hasn't been canceled. And no one came after him or me or Quillette because they knew that we wouldn't buckle. Uh, bullies go after individuals and institutions that they know will buckle. If they go after, if bullies go after an institution and try and get someone canceled and the uh, institution says, well, you know, go screw yourself, it makes them look stupid and powerless, which is, is the opposite of what they want. So they go after vulnerable institutions, which in the current climate, ironically, is progressives. Like progress, progressive institutions are so desperate to keep their progressive bona fides that they're the ones who will buckle at the first sign of people complaining, whereas centrist or conservative publications, like it's it's a great day to be an editor at Quillette because I know that if someone came to me on some ridiculous complaint, uh, I know I could just tell them to go away. I know my editor would have my back, my, my boss, uh, and it's fantastic. Whereas if I were at a progressive place, anyone who came with, to me no matter how stupid their complaint was, they would be able to get me fired based on like if we had a DM exchange that where I was less than obsequious 
in, in my interaction with them. Uh, it can be used as a pretext to show insensitivity. And there's numerous examples of this, uh, including at the CBC. The, the, in terms of the substance of this this article, that, as I said, that Zaid Jilani also wrote about for me, the evidence is clear. You know, the, the protests that took place in the early 1960s helped the progressive cause. It led to the Civil Rights Act because it was largely peaceful. And middle America was like, yeah, why, why aren't black people allowed to be served in restaurants and hotels and stuff like that? The, the moral case was compelling. Uh, that moral case was just as compelling in the late 60s, but you also had some violent riots. And the data that was collected shows that the opinion of middle, middle America turned against progressive politicians to some extent, just enough to swing the 1968 election in several states, enough to give Nixon victory. And if there's data that contradicts that, critics could have presented that, but instead they just wanted to shoot the messenger in this case, because what they wanted to do was enshrine a romantic narrative about violent protest. They wanted to have a heroic narrative of violent protest that suited whether or not these people were themselves violent protesters. It suited them in that moment to imagine everybody out breaking windows and grabbing stuff to be on part of a vanguard of anti-racists. And when somebody said, well, you know what, this, this vanguard historical precedent shows that they'll probably just give Trump another four years in office. And, and by the way, I personally, I think I hate Trump. I think he's, um, he's an awful human being. And I think it's equally awful that progressives who purport to be more adamant than thou in the fight against Trump, when presented with evidence that a certain kind of behavior is going to enhance Trump's chances of winning, that their reaction is to shoot the messenger. Mm -hmm. Like, that's disgusting. Mm -hmm. I mean, these people have no principles. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was, yeah, it, it, uh, it, I'm glad you asked about that example because you could not supply a better example of how many progress, not all progressives, but many progressives want to essentially curate an environment that enhances their own heroic self-conception instead of actually pursuing policies that will actually get politicians politicians elected to further their progressive cause. Right. And I mean, this has been a problem for some time. I mean, people talk about it in relation, in relation to the, the last election, of course, that Hillary yep. Clinton lost because the Democrats preferred to offer up a narrative that, you know, supported their ideology versus discussing what actual people in America were thinking and saying and wanting and basically ignoring half of the population. Well, although, although in, in Hillary Clinton's defense, uh, you know, she did get, I think, three million more votes than Trump. Yeah, like I, 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 I don't think Hillary Clinton was a great candidate for, you know, for 2016. It was just, or it wasn't the right candidate for the time. Um, but that said, um, she she did get three million more votes, uh, and she and and I also I mean in her defense she wasn't quite she wasn't quite as as radicalized as as some of the candidates in the current batch. Like I I think as you know I went to New Hampshire to cover uh, the Democratic primaries, and I was just like shocked. You know I went to Elizabeth Warren's rallies, I went to Bernie Sanders rallies, like you know. People just say, yeah, like, let's tear down the border. Let's get rid of the concept of citizenship. Let's, uh, you know, free this for everyone, free that for everyone. I was like, what? You want to, like, some of the stuff that was discussed, I mean, it was just crazy stuff. Like, even most liberals want the concept of citizenship to exist, right? Um, and, and in the current climate, even most liberals want the police to exist. You yeah. know, they, when, when, when someone breaks into your house or, you know, a, a woman is, is fearful of sexual assault by an intruder, she doesn't want to call the Antifa hug patrol to come save her. Like she wants to call 911 and have police officers with guns show up and put the bad guys in jail. And to the extent Democrats are forgetting that, like they're going to lose 
and they're going to have themselves to blame. And this nutbag is going to be president for another four years and well, it's going to be their fault. Yeah. And this is what I mean. I wasn't, it, I wasn't trying to take a dig at Hillary. Like when she lost, I literally Why must I always defend powerful women when I speak <laughs> like, like, Megan, stop being such a misogynist. Come on. Yeah, really. <laughs> Like, talk about mansplaining. Check yourself, check yourself <laughs> But I just, I mean to say that, like, liberals in general and Democrats in general are, are choosing to be out of touch with reality and what, you know, real people in America want. And, you know, you could probably say the same thing about Canada. Um in in favor of of the ideology and the narrative that they want and it's causing them to lose and so i mean you like talking about the the riots in particular because i've been critical of the riots and i've been critical of nonviolent protests and that's only because i've been talking to people who've done research on this and who've done journalism around this and i've looked at you know research papers and data that does show that it doesn't actually help and also you know on principle like on moral principle i'm opposed to violence i'm opposed to violence no matter who does it like i'm never going to say oh well it's okay for you to beat up this innocent person because you have some valiant political cause supposedly i don't even agree with that it's like what political purpose does this serve but, you know, it is a romantic narrative. So the pushback that I've gotten from it, and, and often it's pushback just from having conversations with people who are providing data that shows that violent protests and riots are not really actually beneficial to marginalized communities. Um, it does seem like it, it's people who like to see themselves as leftists and really want to believe that violent protest or that rioting or that looting is all part of this political cause yep. and therefore if you're critical of that you're attacking the marginalized group this political cause supposedly represents yep. or are advocating on behalf of yeah and by the way just um at the beginning of what you said you i think you misspoke you said you oppose nonviolent protest. oh sorry I think, yes thank yeah, you. I, I think i just wanted to clarify that <laughs> i only so. want violent protests <laughs> <laughs> So disgusted by this nonviolent protest. It's like, these people, these peaceful rock, protesters people, you know, need to get it know. together. Capitalism isn't going to smash itself. Yeah, thank um, you. Uh, so, um, as I say, a lot of this comes down to heroic self conception. And if you criticize the violence, you're implicitly criticizing the heroic postures of the people who, who cheer on these people. And, and it's important to note, so this, uh, the scholar from Princeton we were talking about, whose work resulted in the, uh, the firing of this democratic statistician, uh, crazy story, uh, there, there was other data that was associated with that. And some of the data, and this is, um, I believe it was the same Princeton scholar, uh, in communities where there's violent rioting, the economic consequences are often felt for decades. Uh, home prices stay stagnant for decades. Uh, business formation. Uh, people lose, uh, you know, immigrants who had put down roots there, they move. Uh, they take their stores with them. We've we've seen footage and we've heard stories of, of factories and stuff in Minneapolis that they're never, they're, they were burned down and they're never coming back. And, and to be fair, like, even if you're white or black owned business, like, why would you rebuild in an area that five years from now, you know, why not, why not move to some suburb? where, uh, you know, it's boring, but you're going to be able to produce boxes or computer parts or whatever it is you produce. So this hurts minority communities. And in terms of the heroic self-conception, one thing I've noticed, this is a parochial comment about Canada, is that if you want to get progressive Twitter mad, you don't have to say something they disagree with. Because often they say, ah, oh, you know, that person's stupid. The way to get progressive Twitter mad is to knock out one of the props that they use to make themselves feel heroic. The example I will give is there is this eccentric, loony, sometimes like hateful nut in Canada. I'm sure you know her name. Her name's Faith Goldie. And Faith Goldie has said all kinds of crazy things. And I've seen her on YouTube. Like she doesn't, there's something, you know, there's, a couple of Fruit Loops missing from that box. Like she's just like a weird person. And sometimes she just like does these weird, hateful, provocative things. Like, you know, she's been canceled more times than, than you can uh, count. Uh, and she ran in the Toronto municipal election to become mayor. And she was like some 
you know, whack job, write in candidate. And I think she got like 2% of the vote or 1%. Or, I mean, she got like less than 1%. Eh, whatever, it was a couple of thousand votes or 10 or 20,000 votes out of hundreds of thousands of votes. And there were a lot of progressives in Toronto who went batty. Like they said, oh my God, neo Nazism is on the march. This person got thousands of votes. And I was, it was, it was so insane because it was clear that like you could have put Captain Kangaroo's name on in that slot and people would have checked the box because it was it was like a protest vote it wasn't like oh i'm voting for faith goldie because i want to implement the fourth reich in toronto like it was and yet it became this dogma in canadian progressive circles that there was this uh, that faith goldie was on the leading vanguard of like a very real nazi renaissance in canada and if you called bullshit on that and you said like this is this is insane. You know, she's 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 a, a hater and a nutbag, but she's you know, she's not leading an infantry division into Stalingrad. Like this is this is not what's happening. That was the thing that freaked people out because once you said that and you made fun of them, you were you weren't not, you weren't just disagreeing them with them. You were making them their postures look ridiculous. And that's what they really feared and hated. And that that's when they came after me like with a vengeful fury because their pride had been pricked because they rely on people like her to maintain the conceit that they are the thin line of reason and humanity that protects us from the reassertion of fascism. And I remember, uh, you know, Ezra Levant, who is, I mean, I think he's still plugging away at that rebel thing, but there was a, I think even Jesse Brown is at Canada land has gotten, tired of plugging him but there was a period like the only time i ever heard about ezra was from progressives who were tweeting about how ezra was doing bad things like all of the conservatives in my orbit like stopped paying attention to him and i asked myself like why is it so important that progressives are paying attention to him? and the reason is because without faith goldie without ezra levance without like cartoon conservatives and in some cases real haters and nutbags they can't pretend they're heroes they can't pretend they're little Raoul Wallenbergs and Schindlers, like which is what they want to think they are. And everyone, and to be fair, everyone wants to have a heroic conception of their own political activism. You know, you talk to conservatives, and when they were opposing Obama, they weren't just opposing Obama; they were saving the world from communism. You know, Barack Obama was not a communist, but you talk to conservatives, and they wanted to believe that you know they were freedom fighters protecting America from. Uh, from communism. And I, and I saw this on the right and now I'm seeing it on the left. And it all, a lot of it comes down to vanity. You know, we live in a post-religious society. These people want to believe they have a larger purpose in life. And if you say to them, well, actually, you're, you don't really have purpose. You're basically a troll. They will lose their mind to you. <laughs> they, I can assure you they will lose their mind. And it is fun to watch. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. But, I mean, that kind of thing has happened to me and a little bit also, but it's, it is like, Canada, particularly, I mean, actually, Americans do this too, but um, in Canada, progressives and leftists do continue try to try to convince other Canadians and the entire world that Canada is the same as the U.S., which is weird mm -hmm. because we used to want to differentiate ourselves from the U.S. and we're kind of proud of how different we were from the U.S., um, so we want to be like the U.S. Everything here is the same as the U.S. All the politics are the same. Race relations are the same, et cetera, et cetera. And, but also we're really, really bad. We're actually one of the worst places in the entire world. And if you sort of say that's not true, of course bad things happen in Canada. Of course racism exists in Canada. Um, and that should be addressed. But it's people want things to be so much worse than they actually are. And I... It has always sort of baffled me, but I guess your explanation makes sense where people want to feel like they're heroes and that they have like a larger oh, purpose. And if they so, can't pretend yeah. there's some like big threat that fascism is taking over in Canada or what white supremacy or whatever it is, then maybe they don't have anything well, to go on about on I, the internet. I have a, I have a friend, his name is Roy and, and Roy came to Canada as an 18 year old, uh, from Sri Lanka. He came as a refugee. Uh, his father was a Tamil activist in Sri Lanka this is, this is going back to the 1980s. Uh, and his, fa his father actually, tragically, his father was killed by Sri Lankan forces just days after Roy arrived in Canada. He arrived with $100 in his pocket. Roy is now a vice president, an executive vice president at a Bay Street investment firm. 
and uh, his, his son goes to a prestigious private school. And, and Roy, whose last name I won't say, you know, Roy sometimes, at least, <laughs> at, least at first, he got invited to dinner parties from, you know, other, other parents uh, at this very prestigious school. And they, it became clear that one of the reasons he was invited was so that, like, he could tell tales of woe, of racism, uh, and how horrible Canada was. And, and when he didn't play that part, when he said, oh, he's, you know, he said, ah, actually, you know, Canada's a land of opportunity. I'm not sure I've ever actually encountered any real racism here. Um, you know, it's fantastic. Can I have another beer? Uh, everyone was like really disappointed because they wanted that. They wanted to hear that. It enhances their own white savior complex. White people are the worst. I mean, we're, <laughs> we're just, but, but, we're, but we're often the worst for like the opposite reasons than we think. I mean, yeah, yeah. There's, there's way too many white racists, but there's also like just so many annoying, preachy white savior types. And, yeah. and then, actually, this is my problem with, with trolls is like, yeah, I hate right wing trolls. But the nice thing about right wing trolls is like they will come after you and say, I hate you so much. Go back to Israel, Jew. Like they're very direct. You know, it's like, OK, thank you, Mr. Anti-Semitic racist, you know, <laughs> Got it. but but they don't come at you like these progressive trolls who are like, oh, I really want to help you. Like you need to do more listening, you, you know, need to educate yourself. Yeah. And to help you do more listening, I'm going to try and get you fired from your job because <laughs> you doing your job is like hurting people and here's how you pronounce my name and my pronouns and my Patronus. Like, it's just this like insipid thing that just makes you want to slap them. It's and so passive aggressive, which is a horrible. very irritating like, you know quality. What? It's like, I prefer the horrible right wing hater nutbags. Cause at least, first of all, they come at you once, they tell you that you're an awful person and then like they go away and they harass someone else. They, it's, it isn't like this lingering whiny campaign that's all about them. Like the nice thing about the right wing nutbags is they think they're protecting like their country or freedom or they want to make America greater again or whatever crap like that. They don't think they're angels, you know, dancing on the head of a unicorn. Right. Like they, they don't, they realize they are angels. They realize that they have a very parochial cause. They want to prosecute that cause. You're in the way of that cause. Get out of the way or I'm going to scream at you. Um, they don't think that they're saving the world. And I, I, I think I prefer the aggressive approach. Like I'm sort of a connoisseur of trolls. And I must say, I, I, I think I prefer the, the direct kind. They're just so much less annoying and sanctimonious. Well, and they're more forthright. Like, I mean, yeah. it's, it's about an honesty thing, too. It's like these progressives aren't really being honest. They're pretending that they care about you and they're trying to help you and they're trying to save the world from some great harm when you're right. It's really just about them and how they but look they don't, to their they friends actually on the don't, So, OK, I don't, I don't want to tribalize it with they, they, they. Like, I mean, everyone's different. But you sometimes get the sense they don't actually want to save the world quite as much as they say. Like... You can tell, I mean, even at the New York Times, yeah. you can tell that if given the choice between uh, Joe Biden picking a running mate who, like, say, for instance, Amy Klobuchar, who would allow Biden to romp to victory by, by winning middle America, given the choice between that and Biden picking, like, I don't know, Elizabeth Warren or, like, you know, someone who's, like, just much more of much more appeal to like the grassroots but there's less likelihood that biden would actually win the election you get the sense they want him to pick like the risky wingnut because they prefer that he loses in a noble way that yeah. will allow progressives to bitch for another four years yeah and be wounded martyrs as opposed to actually seizing political power mm -hmm. and rolling back some of the garbage that trump has done yeah and and I don't want to paint with a broad brush. I think that most Democrats and most liberals would they want to win. They want to get Trump out of office. They want to get the Republicans out of the Senate or out of the Senate leadership. Uh, but there 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 are some who, if given the choice between their own moral grandeur and actual political influence, would pick their own moral grandeur a hundred times out of a hundred. And unfortunately, I think in Canada where there's this grasping attitude of like 
we say that we're morally independent from the United States, but you see that now at the current protests is like, oh, you think you're racist? Canada's 10 times more racist. And it doesn't matter that as recently as like 2015, 2016, our brand was, you know, America is the racist problem, we're the cure. We are the mother's milk of kindness and multiculturalism and all this stuff. And that changed very abruptly. It changed when, when Trump dominated the narrative. And I think a lot of Canadians who just like have this reflex that they want to be noticed by America and by the American media. And um, they realized the only way to do that was was by jumping up and down and saying, well, we're just in the same way we, were, we thought we were kinder than you five years ago. Now we think we're more racist than you. Uh, and so come interview me about how racist we are. And the truth is like somewhere in the middle. The truth, of course, there are racists in Canada. Of course, we treated our indigenous peoples in a horrible way. Like so much of the stuff we said five years ago was was garbage. Like, you know, we were hypocrites then. But now we've gone in the other direction where we're proclaiming ourselves a sort of hell on earth, a kind of like Mordor of bigotry, when that's plainly not true either, uh, especially in regard to, to police forces. Like this is the weirdest thing. So if, if you look at a lot of these problems in the United States, like Ferguson, for instance, one of the big scandals in Ferguson was that the police received very little training. It was like it was like a mall cop situation where, you know, sometimes they had I don't know, six weeks, two months of training. I've I've embedded in police forces in the Toronto area for a couple of days. Like I've gone out with cops and done ride alongs. And it's a completely different. These people, they do continuing education. They often have college degrees. It's a much more multicultural force. I was just completely impressed with the level of education and training. They spend a lot of time on social media, learning to understand the communities they're serving. The idea that you could say, oh, Canada's police forces are the same as the America. I mean, how ignorant would you have to be to think that way? I mean, even by the numbers. Yes, it's true. The Canadian police officers, we, we saw a story out west where, you know, they, they beat up some guy, hauled him out of his car and then beat him up. It was an, an indigenous guy. And we don't know the full story, but there's, there's plenty of bad stories. A country of 35 million people. But the idea that you can compare Canadian police forces to, to Minnesota or to Ferguson or Baltimore, like how stupid and ignorant must you be to look at the numbers and look at the differentials in training and say, oh yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah. There's no nuance. It's, and it's just Canadians saying, well, whatever's going on in America, you know, we want, we want our own version of that and we want the media to attest to that version of that. Totally. Really, yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, and so on that note, I want to talk about what's going on at the CBC. Um, which I think that you'll probably enjoy. <laughs> you're very, I know you're very invested in the CBC. I've like, I've recently, I'm being sarcastic in a way. Um, I guess, I mean, one of the main things that I wanted to talk to you about was what happened recently to Wendy Mesley, who right. you probably only will have heard of if you're Canadian, but you know, she's been at the CBC for like 40 years or something, right? And she's uh, I don't know I don't know if it's 40 but it's it's I think it's certainly over 30 years. I mean she's a lifer at the CBC. Yeah. It's it's, it's terrible what's happened to her. So yeah. I why don't you kind of explain to so, the audience yeah. what what went down? Now if you follow my Twitter account, you know that I tweet about the CBC a lot and half the time I do it I'm like why am I doing this? I don't listen to the CBC anymore. In fact, the reason I stopped listening to the CBC was I remember the show it was I think it was Carol Off uh, was interviewing Vickery Bowles, uh, the chief librarian in Toronto, about Vickery's, you know, worse than Hitler decision to uh, allow you to speak in Toronto in late 2019. And Carol Off, who's the host of a show, I think it's called As It Happens, like absolutely lost her mind and compared you to like a Holocaust denier. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, a network that allows this person to host a flagship afternoon show is not a serious network. Um, it's not a network I want to listen to. It's not a network I want my tax dollars going to, but I have no choice in that. And I was never one of these conservatives who said, oh, defund the CBC. I always recognized that there was um, value in having a national media network, in having national news, sports coverage. There are certainly many rural communities. Historically, many conservative MPs have championed CBC radio because if you're you know, driving up around, I don't know, Edmonton or Lethbridge or uh, Northern Saskatchewan, like, you know, sometimes it's the only thing on the airwaves. Um, but it's, it's gone off the rails, uh, even by its own standards in, in recent years. What's happened to Wendy Mesley. So Wendy Mesley, a longtime TV news host, 
And she was in an editorial board meeting or an editorial meeting uh, planning her show. I think it's a, she has a show on Sunday, or she did. And the show was about some of the issues we've been talking about. There was going to be some guests, um, uh, I think at least two of whom were black. And she was having a candid discussion with editorial colleagues about some of the former statements and pronouncements and opinions of her guests. And she quoted one of her black guests, one of their public pronouncements or something they'd written. Uh, and in the process, as I understand it, used the N word, but not using the N word for in, in the way you would mean it as, as a slur or to attack somebody. She was using it as a quote. And there, there are plenty of historical quotations, unfortunately, uh, by uh, that, that, that contain the N-word, it's highly stigmatic, it's, it's highly stigmatized for, uh, for a white person to use the N-word, uh, you know, even to make trouble. I would certainly never use it on a podcast or anything like that. I recognize that uh, people respond horribly to it. It has all kinds of terrible historical connotations. That said, she wasn't using it at face value. She was using it at arm's length to quote something that a black person had said in a candid closed door conversation with colleagues with whom one would think everyone would understand this is how she is using the word. She is not using it to impugn anybody. She is using it for in an informational context to describe uh, someone, something someone had said. Uh, this, her use of the word was reported. It's become this huge incident. She's been suspended. There's an investigation. I'm guessing the CBC will drag their feet on the investigation until uh, social media does its dirty work for for them and she's somehow shamed or um, you know she's mobbed to such an extent that CBC can wash their hands of her uh, and, and absolve themselves I think the management of the CBC has shown themselves to be completely gutless and without principle this is someone who's, who's given her entire career to the CBC and for her to be shamed like this with the complicity of CBC management is such a a horrible indictment of every single executive who works in that organization. Um, I've, you know, I've, I've been in journalism for, for 22 years. I've written plenty of critical things about the CBC. I've appeared on the CBC numerous times, uh, probably most recently, probably like early 2019. Uh, this is the first time I've ever thought that the organization is so diseased internally in regard to the way they treat people. And in a, it's like a snitch culture, the place should be the place should be shut down. Everyone should be fired. They should rebuild it from scratch and have everyone apply for their jobs again. It's an absolutely disgusting spectacle taking place at the CBC. A complete witch hunt. Yeah, no, it's funny because I've been thinking the same. I mean, I've been a supporter of the CBC my whole life. I mean, when I was a kid, my dad had the CBC radio on every single morning. And so it was just like in the background all the time. I used to listen to it every day and I stopped listening to it. Uh, regularly. I started listening to it a little bit again, just to keep up to date on what Bonnie Henry was saying at the press conferences. But other than that, I just can't stand it anymore. I mean, it's become such biased, phony garbage that I can't even turn it on. And I would never have thought of myself as somebody to say defund the CBC. Like I've always opposed privatization and in general but you know obviously I like you see the value specifically in there being a nationally funded public broadcaster um, and you would think that the privatization of the media would be more harmful than having sort of a publicly regulated media center I mean, but, yeah and I like, have my problem with the you know with privatized well, problem of with course, privatized I media. Do too. It's, it's, yes. Yeah, it's not, by the way, it's not for me to have a problem with it or not. Like, if people start a radio station and successful, that's that's fine. Uh, but one of the reasons I used to listen to CBC radio is is I didn't want to hear like shock jocks. Yeah. Um, I was never one of these people who was like, you know, I, I you know, listen to Howard Stern or these shows where they do prank calls. Um, you know, I'm something of an intellectual snob. I don't know if you realize this, Megan, but I can be a little bit of an intellectual snob. And, and <laughs> I don't and, know and, if that's a bad thing, to be honest. <laughs> CBC at its best. And by the way, there are still shows on CBC if you tune into them, especially regional shows that are apolitical and perfectly fine. Uh, some of the Sunday shows are still on radio pretty good, although I haven't listened to them in ages because the whole brand is so polluted for me. Um, in the age of podcasts, though, 
like I used to listen to CBC radio on my way home from the National Post when I worked there, I guess, in the early 2000s. By the time I stopped working at the National Post in 2014, this was already an era when I could load up my phone with NPR and BBC podcasts, and I, I didn't depend on the radio. And once I no longer depended on the radio and I could listen to really elite media from around the world, yeah, CBC just seemed like such amateurish garbage. Like, if, like, so this show where they compared you to a Holocaust denier, um, like this is this wasn't some like, you know, college radio show that they were replaying. Like this was this was as it happens, it was their flagship and remains their flagship afternoon show. And it wasn't, you know, you say, oh, it's it's become this sort of like phony left wing garbage, you know. At least if it's phony left wing garbage, give me good phony left wing garbage. Like give me polished propaganda that changed my mind. The show where they attacked Vickery Bowles, that was just some middle aged Toronto woman losing her mind. And there was no consequences. Like it's it's not like uh, <laughs> you know, she was suspended or anything like that. Like I'm sure uh, all, all her pals in Toronto were, so, oh, you know, good on you, Carol, for you know giving Megan a, a slice of your mind. It was, and I, and as I say, that was the time I stopped listening. I said a, a network that permits this, where this is part of their culture, and now what you see with Wendy Mesley, um, and it's 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 interesting. It's it's women who get this treatment, right? It's mm-hmm. you, it's Victory Bowles, it's um, it's Wendy. And it's, it's institu- institutions where they try and attack people they think are vulnerable. They never come after me anymore because they, they, you know, they never come after my boss, Claire, because they know like that, that wouldn't, that would get them nowhere. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they come after people they think they can bully. So, yeah. And I wanted to talk to you about the diversity committee at the CBC because Um, I didn't know about this until very recently and I can't remember if it was you that told me about it first or it was, it was somebody that you, I think that you put me in touch with who used to work at the CBC who also talked to me about it and told me what was going on. But I, I, first of all, it sounds creepy, the diversity committee. Second of all, what they're doing is incredibly creepy, but I also I guess just find it amusing in certain ways because what's happening right now is that there's this big brouhaha at the CBC about it not being diverse enough and that it's like really important that right now everyone at the CBC stop everything that they're doing and start ensuring that the CBC is actually diverse. (laughs) And, uh, you know, like I think you probably followed this Christine Genier, who I'd actually never heard of before, recently resigned over this issue saying that, you know, like there was, you know, a culture of, White supremacy oh, that was the, or racism? The, 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 the Yukon thing? Yeah. Yeah, that, that was like a fake resignation, isn't it? Because she... Oh, if okay. I, well, okay, don't don't take my word for it. But I, when I read this this document, it was like, I'm resigning, and the only thing that could prevent me from resigning, I think like one of the conditions was that there would be this sort of multi-platform day of reckoning where it was like a struggle session where everyone would air all their complaints about how racist the CBC was. And I think presumably like this woman, she would curate it or something. It was this whole performative thing, but it like a resignation is like, I quit. See you later. But it wasn't like that. It was like kind of the only thing that could bring me back were the, or, you know, the following 17 demands. But yeah, I did see that. Yeah. And I, I also heard, I think, uh, Jesse Wente on the CBC today, just not because I was listening to the CBC White radio, supremacy, but I apparently, was listening yeah. to it. But he it's, said, yeah, sorry, not just ahead. racist, it's not just racist, it's apparently like a white supremacist radio and TV station. Yeah. Is what, uh, so I guess yes. the diversity committee has been failing to no, do its job if failed. the CBC is doing <laughs> so badly. The diversity committee has, presu- has presumably been taken over by white supremacists. Um so first of all, like they change the names of these things all the time and every department seems to have its own committee. And one of the terrifying things apparently about working there is everyone has seven different people they can be reported to. So all you need to do is get investigated by one of these apparatchiks and, you know, that's your life for the next six months. On top of which, like the union, there's, you're also in a union, which is supposed to protect you, but like the union has its own oversight mechanisms. And even if nobody reports you to any committee, 
you might just get blacklisted on internal message boards and something gets kicked up to Canada land, which is now a gossip site, which scrapes the barrel of CBC message boards. So you don't even have to be reported to a committee. You can just be reported to, you know, the bros who run Canada land and uh, they'll gladly air dirty laundry of anybody accusing anyone of racism. So a terrifying place to work. Um, and the last thing on anybody's minds seems to be a editorial quality, which is why no one listens to or watches the CBC, but also secondly, um, the most important kind of diversity, which is ideological diversity. And one of the reasons everyone's accusing everyone else of racism at the CBC is like, that's the only thing they know how to do. You know, they're, they're all recruited from the same schools, uh, come in with the same mindset. They all want to produce the same kind of segments. And so they're all programmed to think, well, I'm not happy. I'm pissed off. I want to get back at my boss. They all have the same weapon at their hands, which is the same set of accusations. And as we've learned, it's never enough, right? Like, no matter how diverse, no matter how many committees you set up, no matter how many um, hotlines, zero tolerance, this, zero tolerance, that, at the end of the day, you're just another white supremacist media website, according to Jesse Wente. And, and what's amazing about this current environment is, I'll, I'll give you an even crazier example, um, the Poetry Foundation which is based in Chicago. It's this highly well-endowed poetry charity. I don't expect people to know, but I only know about it because of this crazy thing. It runs Poetry Magazine, which, you know, not a brisk seller at airport newsstands, but is in that subculture is a big deal. You know, if you're a poet and you get published there, it's a big deal. And their leaders just resigned over like nothing. And when I say nothing, I mean that... Poetry, the Poetry Foundation released this statement, like everybody else did, right after the um, Minnesota protests, the Minneapolis protests, saying, you know, racism is terrible, it's horrible, we stand against white supremacy, this and that. A bunch of poets said this statement didn't go far enough because it didn't indicate your own complicity and whatever. They released this three-page manifesto full of all these complaints about, like, really vague stuff about how poets of color have felt uncomfortable, you know, nothing particularly specific. And then they said, and we're giving you seven days to respond. And if you don't respond, we're not going to send you any more poems. Like that's literally their threat was that, which again, in the poetry world is a big deal, I guess. We're not going to send you our poems. How are you going to publish a poetry magazine without our poems? And again, there was no real complaint. Like it, like at least with Wendy Mesley, they said, oh, you said this, this word. So you're a racism witch. In this case, there was like nothing. It was just kind of, we're pissed off and we're gonna weaponize this moment and get mad at you. And it worked. Like the the head of the, the, the board, uh, I think the editor of the magazine, like all these officials stepped down for like basically no reason. It was just a bunch of people who decided they were gonna weaponize the moment, get a bunch of attention, destroy the reputation of an organization for their own moral self-aggrandizement, and it completely worked. And unlike at the CBC, they didn't even pretend to have a reason. They just did it. So that's the kind of world we live in. Are you, are you even more depressed now? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can get more depressed, to be honest. I, and I'm not even joking. Like, it's like, I feel we like... That because it's actually a great moment to be Megan Murphy or John Kay. Because, like, I got like 1,200 new Twitter followers in the last week because people are so horrified by this stuff that they they flock to Quillette now. Like we, right. we're we're killing it at Quillette. Um, I mean, I, I I generally like our stuff all the time. I'm a big supporter of my own uh, of Quillette, but um, the numbers are through the roof because people are disgusted by it. And I imagine that you're probably getting a lot more attention for your own media. One of the ironic effects of this is that the woker these witch hunts get, the more progressives are like half the people who write for me are now progressives who are just disgusted by their own movement. And, and that's how I got you. That's how I got you to write for Quillette and for the walrus yeah. is you were, you needed a place that would call bullshit on your own people because they were acting horribly. And more and more my writers at Quillette, they're not even conservatives. They're, they're, they're progressives who are just disgusted by what they're seeing. And these are great days for you and me who are the last people that these people want to empower. Like, but they're doing it 
because they're just repelling their own followers with their their tactics. That's true. I mean, I like there's so few media outlets that I even want to be bothered to read because they kind of just pump out the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. And you could just predict exactly what they're going to publish about whatever. I wonder what, I wonder what slate will say about the protests. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, when was the last time I read anything on slate? Exactly. And these are publications that I used to read regularly. Slate Slate used to have Christopher Hitchens. It used to have, uh, I mean, it, God, it used to have so many great writers. Yeah. Uh, it used to have Anne Applebaum. Uh, it's, it's, it's so sad what happened to these places. And now you look at it, and it's, it's like you're reading Teen Vogue. Yeah. It's, oh, it's, totally. It's so sad. And so, yeah, and so I do. Like, I read Quillette probably more than, like, any other publication at this point. Just That's because you it's like... <laughs> <laughs> That's why like, you should. It's like they'll be like alternate opinions they'll be like well argued pieces like it's like i want to hear something new and i want to like i want to hear the data and i want people to be challenging the status quo which is what progressives are supposed to be doing supposedly but there's just so few of them who are willing to do it the amazing thing is that like quillette is is well it's not five quillette is like less than 10 people work at quillette and 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 this is ironically this is the future i think of media is smaller teams because The reason we have social trust, the reason we have a cohesive um, framework at Quillette, and which gives us the ability to run different opinions and contrary opinions and left and right, is because we're a small team with high social trust. CBC, one of the reasons it's become such a joke is it's thousands of people and there's no social trust. And this is one of the reasons I think media is going to get smaller because you just can't run a media organization anymore where like you're hiring new people every week you don't know who they are they're all five minutes away from running to twitter you know to talk about how their bosses are racist it's it's it's, the current situation means you're going to get smaller tighter teams of people who trust each other uh or you're going to get i mean people like you like you know you're you're a youtuber and you're on your own and people trust you because you're one person yeah Um, i think that's part of the future yeah, totally. I mean, I'm I'm so grateful that I did things the way that I did, which was partly totally just accidentally because there were so few places that I could ever publish my work at anyway. But, you know, I, because I have control over everything that I produce and because I'm working with such a small amount of people, you know, like at Feminist Current, it's like I have a few other people helping me out, but I intentionally just kept it small so that I had control over everything essentially and it can't sort of get out of hand because you don't have as you say all these people that you don't know that you're not connected to especially when you're working online and you don't even know these people in person it becomes kind of risky but also you know now I'm so grateful that I have this YouTube channel and like a whole other podcast so I can talk about whatever I want to and I don't have to worry you know once you've been canceled enough times you sort of stop having to worry about getting canceled because it's like, well, I don't care. Like keep canceling me. I'm just going to keep doing exactly what I was doing. And I'm going to keep talking about the things that I'm, I think are important to talk about. And that's what people want to hear. They want to hear actual, real, honest conversations. They want to like know the data. They don't want to hear this regurgitated ideological phony um, content that's, that's being produced by so many um, media outlets in Canada and the U S now. But the good news, and I think uh, you're showing uh, how this works, is that the digital tools people have um, now allow them to work in small teams. Um, like 10 years ago, the idea that I would be able to run a podcast, that I would be able to do my own audio editing, uh, that I wouldn't need like a producer hovering over my shoulder, that the, the equipment wouldn't cost tens of thousands of dollars, that I'd be able to do my own graphics editing, even some primitive video editing. Um, you know, tools like WordPress have existed for for many years, but now, if if you want to, you you no longer need a whole team of artists and copy editors and graphic designers. Um, when I look at the, the number of people who are employed at print publications, uh, especially the magazine I was at, I mean, these are skilled, smart people. But I mean, you don't need these people. They just I, It's sad to say you don't need them. And unfortunately, when you bring them into an organization, it's just one more person who you have to worry about them losing their mind because their brother's girlfriend 
is upset by something that your colleague put on Facebook. Like it's just teams are going to get smaller. The technology allows the teams to get smaller. That's the good news. Yeah. Um, or same worrying about working with somebody who's going to threaten you with a tweet because you yeah. publish something that they don't like and they're going to, you know, take down yeah. your in job or organization or whatever. Or try to anyway. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. And um, plus it's like, it's nice to go to sleep at night, not worrying about that stuff. I mean, that's another reason ultimately, like why did the New York times editors cave? Why are, why are the CBC editors acting so gutless? Um, it's just fear. People are people are motivated by by fear, especially unfortunately, especially toward the end of their careers. Like some of the most woke people I know are people who are like older than me, who are five years away from pension. They they want to just like live out the rest of their career in their corner office, shuffling paper and not having to worry that their name is going to be in the headline of some article about the white supremacist culture at the cbc or whatever and so they'll just do whatever they need to do they'll say whatever they need to do they'll fire whoever they need to fire they'll shame whoever they need to shame to protect their own careers mm -hmm. uh it's, it's a sad way to to live out the end of your career but that's what people are choosing to do in instead of um instead of the hard fight which is going to be required to to recapture this this landscape it's it's journalism is in a very bad way right now um yeah I've never seen it worse. Yeah, it's awful. Um, no. And I, you know, I was going to ask you finally what you thought a better model for media is, but I think you kind of answered it in some ways. So it's smaller. Yeah, it's yeah. going to get smaller. It's um, it, the problem is the small team model works best when you maximize social trust by having people actually like exist in the same space. And the, the one the one thing that's not great about Quillette is like my boss is in Australia. I have two colleagues in the UK. Uh, one guy is in Colorado. There's me in Toronto. And so it's like once a year we'll get together. Like we'll meet in, you know, I think we were in Milwaukee. To, we were in Toronto. But it's it's a rare occasion. Um, that's the downside. And I think I see so many people saying, oh, this is great, you know, the nice thing about COVID-19 is it's made us realize we can all work from home and we never have to see each other. And it's like, that works for a couple of weeks. After a couple of months, and this isn't just journalism, you're not going to feel connected to people. Like, you know, you're, there's going to be less loyalty and less bonding and less trust. If you just treat everyone electronically and you don't see them in person, and I, I say that as somebody who's antisocial, like... Um, I didn't have to change my lifestyle a lot when I went on COVID-19 lockdown, but even an antisocial curmudgeon like me realizes that there's some value in, in human connection. And, and that's, that's something that goes beyond journalism. I think that's something that a lot of white collar organizations are going to have to deal with because people need to be with other people. There's, there's no substitute. Yeah, I know. I agree. I, yeah, I know. I've, I've been feeling really, I you know, I'm sort of in a similar position to you where I didn't have to change my lifestyle too, too much when everything shut down because I'm used to working at home. And obviously I was also traveling a lot to do events and things like that and doing media things like, like you do also. But, you know, I, and it was okay for a while. I was like, this is fine. It's not that different. I can focus on different things. But yeah, after a certain point, it just starts to get really, it starts to get really lonely and really depressing. And it's because human beings need to, you need to have in real life. I would still meet with people in real life. I would still have meetings with people. We would go for coffee, we'd go for a drink. And, you know, and these big events now are lost where you're, you're connecting with all these people that maybe you were, on, you were talking to online for the most part, but you can reconnect and you... You realize, I mean, essentially well, you realize you have to treat other human beings like human beings, but, but you, it also you remember, your mental health. We've talked about this, that after you did your event in Toronto, I think it was November 2019, is that was in November? Yeah. And then I met you and some of the other speakers and organizers at, at the bar for mm -hmm. like an hour. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I remember it was just like a brief social encounter, but... To this day, like when people will say, says, oh, yeah, I met you that night or, you know, my friend met you. That. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's, it's this instant connection. And also, like if I have an editorial collaboration with anybody like that, they would have to do something really bad 
for me to like throw them under the bus or tweet about them or, or like, you know, or for mm -hmm. me to criticize it because even that brief meeting was enough to like create a bond and said, you know, do I want to be the kind of person who like I had a drink with that person and then I slam them on Twitter or whatever? It's probably not. Yeah. Uh, and, and and actually it doesn't take a lot. I, I think even people who work from home, I think, I think th there should be like, you know, whether it's like Tuesdays and Thursdays or Fridays or whatever, um, you know, that, that is one, one piece of workplace ad advice and, and something that extends beyond journalism, because I think other professions should be looking at journalism and saying, how do we avoid that? Like you don't see plumbers and electricians going online and saying, oh man, you know, all plumbers are racist except me. And, uh, you know, I'm so sick of like white supremacy and electricians work. Like it's, they just go and work and do useful things. Right. So, but who knows what's going to happen in five or 10 years. So I think part of the role of journalists now is to <laughs> warn the world, like, don't let your professional culture become what, what has become of journalism. That's, uh, we, 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 that's something we have to, that should be part of our activism. It's like learn from our example. Totally. So anyway, but thanks for having me on your podcast. It was fun. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming back on. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Good conversation as always. And I'm sorry I look like this. And I just want to say, I, I know that as I, we said earlier, I know the top of my head is cut off. That's intentional because my hair is out of control. <laughs> People in Toronto have not been able to get haircuts and I'm still working on the lighting I, I have not yet figured out how to <laughs> how to how it make me not look like some troglodyte in a cave. Have you but tried a, a ring light? I have a ring light. Okay. And made me look like I was being interrogated by the, fa <laughs> by the fashion police. <laughs> for, for, it was just it was it was just too much John under that light. Right. Like I was like and but then when it's not enough John, it's kind of like Gollum in his cave. So I gotta yeah. find. But I'm working on it. Okay. On it. Yeah. Well, good luck with your at-home <laughs> <laughs> studio. Okay. Um, and yeah, thanks again for your time. I really appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Bye, everybody. Take care. Okay, bye.